Northeastern Pennsylvania played a very, very big part in the American Industrial Revolution, uh, mainly because what was found here in abundance, uh, as most local residents know, is anthracite coal. Coal was here for power, a large immigrant population at that time. Uh, we've got records that go back to that period of time where you could buy coal for a dollar a ton. And so this company generated its own electricity in the late 1800s through the early 1900s, sold it back to the power company. So it was really a very innovative story. Uh, Immigrants were brought here by the tens of thousands, many recruited directly by coal companies to come here as skilled, both skilled and unskilled labor, to work in the coal mines. So when it comes to the American Industrial Revolution, anthracite coal played a very, very significant role uh, in firing that revolution. The, the men worked the mines, the story goes, the, the, uh, the women. Mining wages were, in those days, were very, very low and very cruel conditions. The women worked in the mills and frequently the children worked in the mills. And there's, there's many stories uh, of children working in these mills at the age of 12, which would have been twice as old as they had to be to work in a mine. Mostly textiles are considered woven goods, goods that are made on a loom um, with weft yarns and weave yarns. And when I started, uh, I was, uh, I guess you would call a floor girl, but I mean, that was a nice word for it. <laughs> it was a bobbin girl. One of the reasons that, that silk stayed here was quota. Silk became, you know, it's a military um, fabric. I, um, uh, the um, silk is an, ama is, a, is an amazing textile. In fact, before we had high-speed bullets, silk was used as body armor. Over 60 just in the city of Scranton, so the history says. And I believe that's the case. If you drive around Scranton, Carbondale, Wilkesboro, and neighboring communities, faded paint on the side of some of the older buildings, you'll see something, silk mills, or um, there's still a few signs like that. Uh, I liked every job I had. I really did. I didn't mind getting dirty. I did really. I mean, it was hard getting the uh, black stuff out of your skin. We used to rub it against the windowsill where that was stone, if you don't mind. Rub it in order to get it that clean, you know, because if you use benzene on it, it would burn your skin. For You had enough of that. Clean them off, the spabbins off, you know. Yeah. Because so much silk was processed here, woven here, that um, it was natural that the garment industry would, um, would settle here. And um, so they're, they're closely, they're sort of cousins to each other. Anthracite coal reaches its peak in 1917 when over 100 million tons of coal are mined throughout the region. Uh, by the 1930s, that number falls to about 40 million tons of coal, and it continues to fall until World War II when there's a little bit of a respite. By af but by after the se end of the Second World War, the industry is really on its knees. So where men became the unemployed and the underemployed, women went to work in factories to support families in many, many cases. It, it was a thing when the mines went down. I mean, all, all the women went in the factories because uh, they weren't getting anything. I mean, their husbands had no jobs, and you know how tough it was. In those days, it was tough. Well, the area became a hub for the uh, manufacture of apparel, uh, clothing for men, women, and children, especially during the Great Depression, during the 1930s, because what was happening if we were to go back in time rough, rough, roughly 100 years ago, at the beginning of the 20th century, most apparel made in factories was made in and around New York City, the Manhattan area. 1932, I was 16, I think it was 32, I was 16 years old and I had to quit work, quit school, couldn't graduate because I was in 11th grade ready to graduate and I had to start working because there was nobody supporting my mother and father. By the 30s, the Chamber of Commerce began to woo some of these businesses into this area to try to buffer the economy because by the 30s, we're dealing with unemployment rates in Scranton of 
35%. So the Chamber of Commerce looked at bringing these businesses in as a way to employ people to lower the unemployment rate. This was a terribly hard hit area uh, of the United States. And so the Chamber was interested in trying to get people jobs. And they did uh, recruit, you might say, some of these runaway firms to come to this area uh, and to hire people. It was a case where it's almost the lesser evil. I mean, do we want to let people in who might run um, something that could be considered a sweatshop and perhaps try to work with them to improve conditions, which they tried to do, or uh, do we want to um, let people stay out of work and perhaps starve. Well, uh, my family was in dire need of money. I had a sister that passed away. She was only 26. My brother was drafted and it was just my mother and my father and I and things were rough. They were rough. So I started in the garment at 1942. That's right. I was about 16 when I started and and I stated before, I would come out of school because I only lived about a block or two away from my school. I would have my mother my books and she would have me at lunch. And off to work I'd go, walk about a mile and a half, rain, snow, sleet, and everything else, and come home at night. And you say, oh, well, you see all the guys hanging around and you're going home because I'm starving, I'm hungry. And you have mulligan stew in the back of the stove. By the Great Depression, there was pressure by many employers to lower wages and because of the demands of labor unions, jobbers or so-called middlemen began to look for contractors outside of the greater Manhattan area who would make manufactured goods for less expensively than could be made in New York. They could escape union contracts and ship the apparel back to the New York City to the retailers, which is where the majority of the marketplace was. And one area where they found an abundance of labor was, of course, in an area that was already depressed by the decline in the demand for coal, and that was the anthracite region of northeastern Pennsylvania. When I first started in the business, and when my dad was in the business, if you went from Forest City up above Carbondale all the way down to Shikshini on the other side of Wilkes-Barre, um, you had thousands and thousands of people that were employed in in both the ladies, well mostly ladies wear and outerwear. Oh, in Pittston there must have been about 40. Going down the main street there was a factory all the way down on one side and a factory all the way down on the other side. And if you didn't like where you were working, you could leave and go next door and work. Or across the street, which I did a lot of times. To ship apparel to New York City in the 1930s by either train or even by truck at that point, in the 30s may roughly have been a four or five hour trip. So it was worth their while to make the, man the manufactured goods here less expensively and ship them to the retail marketplace in New York City rather than to meet the demands of organized labor in New York City and pay higher wages. was down and at the Times, uh, Scranton Times, looking through all these newspapers and um, just by accident when I got to May of 1933, uh, I came across these articles that, that Elizabeth Linet had, had uh, done. Uh, the paper though was very interested um, in doing this and they had announced before she even got started that they were going to conduct an investigation of the uh, so-called runaway garment industry, which was that gypsy industry, so-called, that was uh, leaving New York and Philadelphia during those years and coming. This was, these were the years of the Depression, and they were leaving, uh, not leaving actually, but they were establishing uh, branch plants uh, in areas that they knew uh, where they knew they could hire people cheaply because uh, the Depression had so hurt the economy. She decided to go undercover in some apparel factories uh, in the greater Scranton area and actually became an employee of one or two apparel factories and worked there for a few months as an ordinary worker. Yet at the same time, what she was doing was documenting in her mind as well as on paper after she would leave work 
the actual workplace conditions that she found. On a day-to-day -day basis, when they were checking out, uh, as she reports, um, they might uh, look over the work that they had done and pick up a piece of garment and say, this is a mess, and throw it in their faces. And what she found most commonly were um, what we would call today sweatshop conditions. Women working 50, 60 hours a week, young girls working in apparel factories. She found very few, if any, benefits, uh, no vacation. Um, she also found cases where women were fired for um, very petty reasons. Uh, and she documented those conditions and then wrote about them. The companies and perhaps some of the leading people in industry themselves didn't quite like the idea of being exposed this way. And as I said, one plant, uh, one company did take an ad to say they never did the things. It was all distorted and so on and so forth. But it, it did get a lot of response from, from the public. Um, people, the readership of the paper, um, knew that things were going on. I mean, this was not something that was done in secret. Uh, there were already investigations underway and whatever, and so it simply reinforced what was going on uh, in the minds of many of the readers. So what she helped to do was to raise awareness um, that helped to improve conditions in many of the factories throughout this part of Pennsylvania. It helped the union movement because in uh, 1932, uh, David Dubensky became the president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. And under his presidency, very early on, and it parallels what she was doing, um, that union, which represented the, 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 the trade, you might say, uh, had decided to try to unionize the runaway companies, the people in the runaway companies. Before, they hadn't wanted to do that, but they had decided to do it. And so they were making a big thrust in northeastern Pennsylvania, actually from Allentown and Bethlehem and Reading on up. And so her articles just kind of, uh, you know, created a uh, type of seeding for that whole thing, that people were ready for this. And, and, her, uh, and, and, and workers themselves, you know, uh, who, were, who read this felt that maybe now is the time to do this. And organizing is the crux of the union. Organize, organize, organize because you cannot sit on your backside and get anything done if you don't do it. The ILGWU first came to Scranton in the 1930s. It received one of its first Pennsylvania charters in Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1937. The Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers incorporates in Scranton in the same year. Oh yeah, I was very active with the union. I was a vice chair lady up at our factory. Wherever I worked, I was uh, elected for something. I don't know why, <laughs> but I was a chair lady and a vice chair lady wherever I worked. Most of the sewing factories in this area um, were, and you know, there were tens of thousands of people in this in this geographic area who were working in the uh, in the garment industry. Most of it was the ladies' wear industry. Um, the ILGWU was um, an incredibly um, progressive force for improvements in factory conditions, health benefits, um, appropriate work, work week for, um, for their people. The menswear industry was a little bit different. We had the Amalgamated Clothing and Textiles Workers Union. I was involved when uh, they would give one of the operators a hard time because a lot of people used to come in and they were like simple good people and they weren't used to be being pushed around and sometimes they were and that's when I used to get up and go down to the union office and bring back one of the agents and we'd straighten it out. Well Min Matheson who organized the Wyoming Valley District of the ILGWU from the late 30s to the early 60s built a labor union of 600 members when she found it in the late 1930s to over 11,000 members by the early 1960s when she left to go back to New York City. Well, uh, they came in uh, and, uh, I mean, spoke with us, Min Matheson, and uh, told us our rights, which we didn't know. I mean, most of us, most of the uh, women that were in there were housewives and never went out to work before, but had to. And uh, when they 
when they were explained everything, how things could be better. And at that time, you had an eight-hour day, and it was hard. I mean, and you kept working. You couldn't stop. She was a very brave woman, an unusually brave, uh, vocal woman who wouldn't take no for an answer, who demanded that women, women walk off the job if they were being treated fairly, unfairly. She led many, many strikes. Uh, she met face to face with many employers and negotiated some pretty tough contracts. She loved the people in Pennsylvania. And she was a good mixer. And she always could make arrangements to meet the people that were the right people. I laid in front of the trucks, yeah. And I had, I remember one time, I had real long hair halfway down my back. And Min Mathis came over and braided my hair because she was afraid it would get caught under the tires. She had the support of, for most of her tenure here, of the New York office of the ILGWU because they wanted these factories organized. And they knew that since most of the people who worked here were women, that sending in a strong vocal woman who wouldn't give in easily was probably an asset and probably to the union's benefit. Oh, yes, we used to strike to organize shops and sometimes almost got arrested because we were too close to the building. And uh, they were kind of work, but kind of fun, you know, when you're trying to organize a shop. And we, we fought for everything. When I, come, when I think back, we fought for everything. It was just a continuous fight right on. And it was much easier to send women to the picket line because the men were afraid to hit the women. But lots of them got did. They always used to say, Clem Lines wears the high heels and the silk stockings as their protection. <laughs> Everybody was together. There was no um, splitting. Everybody stood together, and that's why we got what we got. In 1958, it was called the General Dress Strike when the majority of workers for dress manufacturers throughout the Northeastern United States went on strike. Which the whole, the whole dress industry was shut down. And of course there was arguments pro and con what, what the real reason was. And then we had, there were some parts of the segment of the industry that we had where it was owned by certain jobbers that we kept out on strike for 11 months. They call that the big strike. Everybody was on strike, everybody. And that's when uh, some man came to my house. I wasn't there at the time. I think I was out, I must have been shopping. And he told my husband that I, he better tell me that I have to curtail some of my expressions because, so that's when the union sent me up to Croton on the Hudson for a week to kind of calm me down. And slowly, apparel manufacturers in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and elsewhere settled with the ILGWU. However, an organization called the Pennsylvania Garment Manufacturers Association held out. They didn't want to settle with the union. Because uh, the, the, the few days that we were on strike, it, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. It was uh, bad weather, and you didn't know what, you had to go from one place to another. Sometimes we got up real early, maybe 4 or 5 o'clock, and went to this shop up in uh, Sweet Valley to pick it up there because they were bringing in material, and the girls, they call them scabs. They would work. They, I don't know how they got the girls in. I remember one girl being put in one of these uh, big... I don't know what, what they call them, like uh, a wagon. Put her in the wagon, cover her with material, and pretend that it was material going in the plant, yet it was an operator. That one, I want to tell you, was a vicious one. That was, uh, and we had certain elements in the industry. We had, like I know I had one particular plant that was owned by Lucchese, which is Three Fingers Brown, and then I had some others that were owned by where we're getting the work from Abe Chait's firm. I mean, then of course, the Leslie Fay shops agreed that they would abide by the agreement that was made, so they went back to work. We were very fortunate that the Leslie Fay shops 
made that agreement, and they went back after two or three weeks. So what the ILGWU did as a, as a strategy was rather than to settle with the association and its board, they began to settle individual contracts with the individual manufacturers. The idea being that if you settle with the individual manufacturers, eventually you'll put enough pressure on the association that the association will cave in and settle. And sure enough, that strategy worked, with a few exceptions. So that by late spring of 1958, the majority of the factories in this part of Pennsylvania were back to work, with the exception of those factories that were owned, controlled, or directly influenced by organized crime. They were the holdouts. They would not settle. And that's where the ILGWU had to continue to take them to the picket lines in places like Pittston against the factories owned by Russell Buffalino. And eventually, they would capitulate um, and settle what was then a fair union contract. I think uh, they were, they always was talk about being connected to the mafia and you got work if you were connected to, you know, to the mafia. We know by looking at the records of the Pennsylvania Crime Commission, by looking at the records of a special investigative committee set up by the U.S. Attorney General in Scranton in the late 1950s that several apparel factories in this part of Pennsylvania were set up by leaders of organized crime as legitimate fronts for illegitimate activities which included everything from gambling to prostitution to loan sharking to illegal dealings in narcotics uh, and other less than scrupulous you know, types of, of industries. I worked for an undesirable, like I mentioned before, but he wasn't around too much. He had one of his henchmen uh, take care of all the uh, um, prices, prices. He made them, and if you, don't, you didn't like them, well, it's tough. And to sort of have a presence, Russell Buffalino had some of his men, tough guys they were called, marching up and down the street trying to keep the picketers, try, trying to basically intimidate the picketers to scare them off. And Min was leading the line and kept marching at the head of the line of picketers. And one of the tough guys yelled out something to the effect of, to Min, you know, why don't you bring your husband up here to this picket line We'll see how tough he is, meaning that they might do him bodily harm if he came, but they wouldn't do bodily harm to a woman. And Min went over to where the tough guys were and singled out Russell Buffalino and stuck her finger in his face and said, Russ, I don't need to bring my husband up here because I'm twice the man that you'll ever be. Mr. Lucchese, seven men walked in the plant and the seven were all in black. He gave you an eerie feeling, you know, what are we in for? But we never saw those men, we just saw one, and he was the giant of prices. He's the one that used to stand behind me, watch me work, and if you, I dropped my bobbin one time, and he stopped the clock. That wasn't part of the deal, you know, and I asked him, why did you do that? He said, well, you weren't, you weren't doing anything, so, we can't pay you for not doing anything. Organized crime, however, were, they were in the minority of ownership uh, of, of apparel factories. The majority of owners were legitimate, uh, decent people who struggled in many cases to make a living, much like the workers themselves. Oh yeah, we had a, a bowling league which was nice. We represented the ILG. And oh, a lot of times they would have picnics. We, we used to go in the summertime. One lady lived down the road and she worked there too. And we'd go and have a little, uh, a little picnic in our yard because she had a grapevine, you know. I don't know if you ever remember a grapevine and it went over like that and you sat under it, you know. And we used to have a little picnic there with the uh, a factory, a couple of ladies, you know, about maybe by eight or ten of us, yeah. Uh, the place called Rocky Glen. Sometimes we'd only go to Naog, which isn't far. You probably know where that is. The ILGWU had a presence uh, everywhere in the community. It's a name that went well beyond simply organizing. If there was a death in the family, you could count on receiving a food basket or a contribution from the ILGWU. 
if there was a community benefit concert to raise money for a particular cause. You could count on the union's chorus being there to sing to raise money for that cause. Oh yeah, we had the chorus and uh, that was marvelous. We went everywhere. In fact, uh, we went to Washington. We were back up for Willie Nelson. So that was quite a thing. I remember one time we sang for Lyndon Johnson. That was in Atlantic City. There, but after I left, the chorus still continued. The performance of the chorus was a very ideal thing for the people that want to sing. And for the record, I really can't sing. <laughs> and, uh, and we performed nursing homes. We would do a different variety of shows for them, but we would do it. We sang at different conventions, and we sang like at the Pennsylvania FLCIO, at our conventions that we maintain. We went everywhere, and we did a lot of uh, musicals that we put on shows here, which were tremendous. They were received very, very well. And uh, Clem Lyons and uh, Bill Gable were um, a director and co-director of that. And they did a wonderful job and we had a lot of fun. Mr. Boss, it's really tough to sign that lining in the cuff and 20 cents is not enough, you gotta pay me more. Not at all, I don't agree, that cuff is simple as can be. Sit down and do a dozen more. That is one song. Well, we, we would practice maybe four months, five months. And Friday night, Sunday afternoon were big nights in Pittston because we were up over uh, the, the restaurant, the, main, the Pittston Diner. And all the, the men used to come out and stand and listen to the rehearsals. If we don't go out, ain't got the time. We're watching movies made in 1929. So we don't dine. Okay, that's fine. But when I'm feeling moody, he's watching howdy doody. And we and the ILG was very progressive for the women. The they had a health center, and the men and women could go there and get free test of any type. They had a mobile mobile unit that went to the out distance factories, where were they too far away from Wilkesbury? And they took care, and they took x-rays and took care of the people there. If there was a blood drive, you could count on the union being there with its members to donate blood for a particular cause. So this was a union that took care of the basic rights of its workers, but expanded into virtually every aspect of community life and had a real sense, a sense of social activism. We had a resort where our members could go for two days and three days. The ILGWU had a place in the Pocono Mountains called Unity House. This, this was a thousand acre resort dedicated to apparel workers being able to go on vacation and to attend educational programs in a pristine um, sort of isolated mountain setting. Uh, you'd go every year to, uh, to be updated on what was happening and what was going on in the union so that you could go back and tell your people, you know. And you would go, you would go to classes. I mean, it wasn't all fun. And workers from mainly the East Coast would go there for a week in the summertime and attend all kinds of educational sessions on subjects ranging from how to organize a union to how to be politically active to how to process grievances um, to how to maintain equity on the shop floor. And they teach them a little bit of politics, how to run and what to do if you want to be heard. You can't sit down at a machine without being heard. And they would hear speakers ranging from congressmen to governors uh, to presidential candidates, presidential hopefuls like John F. Kennedy was there. If the women were interested and wanted to go and participate in what the union had planned for them, it would have been to their advantage. But there were some who were only there because they, it was a weekend away from home. And they didn't pay that much attention to the, the instructors or anything like that. But the, that was the, the, the minority. The majority of them came from there being you, better union members. I mean, you would go to classes during the day, and then you, the nights were for yourself, and you had 
you went out and you did what you wanted. There was dances, there was uh, everything up there. And then on, like, uh, on a Saturday, you'd have a picnic by the uh, lake. But a lot of times I went with my husband because he liked it up there. It was beautiful. Oh God, that was a vacation in itself to go there. It was beautiful. Some girls never took advantage of it, but if I had the opportunity, I would. Well, you could play tennis, you could play uh, cards, you could watch movies, and eat. A lot of good meals were made up there. And the food there was superb, it was excellent. Saturday night would be a big, big affair, big dance and everybody would get dressed up to the nines, you know. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, the majority of the work that was done in these apparel factories was piecework, um, meaning that you were paid by production. You were paid by how many sleeves you set, how many hems you sewed, how many garments you pressed. Very, very few paid hourly wages. Piecework, yeah. You got very, like, you really had to work hard to make any money. In fact, I think when we started, probably made about $16 a week <laughs> for eight hours a day. Now the factories work seven hours a day. And on Saturday morning, we had to go to work too, half a day. Uh -huh. Those were the good old days. <laughs> There's not a lot of profit to be made in apparel unless you produce a very high-end product or unless you produce lots and lots of a particular product. You had to hustle. And you know, sometimes when you hustle, you make a lot of mistakes. And when you make a mistake, then it's, it takes your time away and you're not getting paid for it. That's the way it was. See, but you only did a section of it, you know? You'd have to sew it and push it fast, you know, and then you get your scissors and clip them apart. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'd be able to do it now. Work came in bundles, and you had to get the, and, and do the bundles and see the parts and get the parts together and then sew it up on your machine. Uh, you got so much a garment, and you, you can tell how hard you worked. Factory work was not easy. It was a penny, a garment, and you can figure how long it took you to do that. So you had to be good. You know, to make anything, you had to be good. I started in the Barbizon, because that was in Jessup. No. Dutch's underwear, woman's lingerie, nightgowns, panties, slips. I used to do, after the slips were made, they used to put a zigzag stitch on the seam, and that's what I did. I did zigzag after the slip was made. Oh, they lasted forever, those slips. You know, I don't think they even wear too many slips, do they? Petticoats? <laughs> slips? I did pants on cuffs. I did cuffs on knickers, which you probably don't even know what they are. They're, they came to, the golfers used to wear them. They, they come to the knees all in young boys. Then when they grew older, they wore long pants. I was a ruffle maker. Whatever, I don't think you'd know what that is, but they had little ruffles on their children's clothes, and we would hem them. Set and zippers. You had to make sure they laid flat. Couldn't have any wrinkles like you see in some of the stores now. You buy a jacket, you see your, your zipper is all wavy. Well, I was a sewing machine operator. You call it D-work, like. And uh, it was really a nice place to work. Very pleasant. Blind stitching is, uh, you put the uh, hem on the bottom of the garment, on the dresses and on the sportswear and the kids' clothes and stuff like that. I was an overlocker, you know what I mean by overlocking. It's the five thread, you know, that little curly stitch you get on inside your clothing. When I was hired, I was supposed to be uh, a sewer. And the day I got, you know, I got called in to go to work, um, the boss said, I have a different job for you. I have a bundle boy job open instead of sewing. Would you like it? And I said, sure. So instead of uh, 75 cents an hour, I got a dollar. There was pleating. And then we put the, the baby hem. Before it was pleated, you'd get as long as this table. 
uh, pieces of material. And you would go all around that on this. Uh, in fact, I still have the folders from my job. But putting a belt on a machine if it broke. Uh, I like to explain, we, uh, we didn't have individual machines then until they, the, the early part. But then they came in with individual. You put a belt on, it was a long shaft with maybe 10 machines on each side. And you couldn't stop the machine, the, you couldn't stop the motors because you would lose production. So you would get that large belt, twist it, and you have to try and put it on a big wheel. All in one stroke with a big screwdriver. So it goes right around, so that, was, that took talent. <laughs> Gold Star made uh, boys' trousers and men's trousers also. Uh, many different kinds of trousers and uh, we uh, made for different big name organizations like you know same almost the same pair of pants but with different labels on them you know sometimes it was fascinating you know you get this bunch of material thrown on your machine and you're supposed to make something out of it and when you learn how to do it it was fascinating to a certain degree you know when I went to Leslie Fay, I was really happy there. And I was old enough to retire, but I didn't retire because I enjoyed the work. It was an experience. I met a lot of nice people. Some of my employers were not the nicest, but like I said before, we coped. We had to. We didn't know any, any other way to do things, so we did the best we could. It's a clean place to work for. The people, the Alperns, were always good to me. You know, I, uh, like I said, I had many jobs throughout and I was compensated well for it. And it's hard work, it, it really is. But I'll tell you, it helped raise our kids and helped us uh, pay our bills and got, get them a better education. So by the time we settled the 1958 general dress strike in, the, in 1958, jobs in the apparel industry are already beginning to be siphoned off overseas to cheaper manufacturers. So this notion of the deindustrialization of the apparel industry begins in the United States in the 1950s. The beginning of the decline of the unions was, of course, the Judy Bond fight, which took in maybe around the 60s, early 60s, and maybe even a year or two earlier that, they were the first, in the, not the first industry, but the, but the first uh, aspects of our industry to go, and it was a blouse company, they made blouses. And they decided to go overseas and had to make, I don't know if it was in Bangladesh or uh, Sri Lanka, one of those countries, and they set up business there. And they started sending their work in, into here. And of course, it, it all, then we start losing part of that work. NAFTA finds its roots in the late 1950s by essentially eliminating trade barriers and opening up free trade with countries that were threatened by communism and by socialism. The idea is you let those countries take America's low-wage, low-skill manufacturing jobs, in turn sell those products back to the United States. And then the theory is that the United States will retain the high-end cream of the crop jobs that require decent educations um, and that will prop up and support the American economy and prop up and support so-called developing economies of a variety of countries which were struggling we did recognize when uh, President Nixon opened up the door to China, when, when we finally recognized them, that here was this vast engine of, of uh, potential industry today is, in fact, uh, they're meeting that potential, that it would be very difficult to compete with them. So uh, right from that period of time, we started to look on how do you deal on a worldwide basis. But I left in 1975, and uh, I know some of the women said that it was getting worse, you know, to make a, a decent living because there were too many uh, 
things made overseas and the competition was bad. It was not bad, it was hard to take. Because you could feel it, you could tell there was something going on. And then I just saw uh, factories starting to close. You know, I, I would say, yeah, in the early 80s maybe. Because factories started to close, little at a time. It wasn't as noticeable. But uh, you could see this was starting to go overseas and this was starting to go overseas. And pretty soon, I mean, it was all gone. But things were getting slower then. The factories were moving out. Some had moved south, some had moved overseas. Yeah. It was hard for a girl to get a, a job. Yeah. And as a result, we have seen the American economy lose tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, the jobs like you see behind me today, that have gone to Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Vietnam, El Salvador, uh, elsewhere. And we, in turn, have been left with a manufacturing workforce in this nation, is a, which is a fraction of what it once was. When the factories start closing, we try to do everything to, to hang on to them. There's people with 50 people in the shop, 25. We, you had Leslie Fay. Uh, uh, Leslie Fay was like 500,000 people with different, the main factory and plus other small shops. We, I, was, I went through that. Leslie Fay employed about 2,000 people in Pennsylvania. And by the end of 1995, they employed less than 50 in Pennsylvania. Leslie Fay was the quintessential example of what happened to the American apparel industry. Not only did the company take advantage of free trade agreements to send its jobs overseas, but it also got itself into such a financial bind that it had no way to get out of bankruptcy other than to find less expensive labor elsewhere, which is what they did. It was, it was sad when we left Leslie Fay because it was nice. And we had like over 100 employees. And uh, it was a sad thing when that closed. But at that time, all the factories closed. Both Clinton and Bush both supported NAFTA. And we realized, you know, it, uh, my father and my uncle and Jane and I sat down, and we realized that the, um, the end of the protection that was being provided to the industry was upon us. You know, the textile industry um, has, still has vestiges of that protection, but they basically sold the apparel down the river by saying that as long as the textiles are made in the United States, you could sew it in a low-cost country and bring it back into the United States um, without paying the duty on it. When they came in with a chef, uh, NAFTA, they were sending them work out, and we were getting less because they could make it cheaper somewhere else. Um, evidently, our country probably thought it would work out for both sides, and it seemed like Today, it seems like it worked out for everyone else but the USA. Um, and so whether or not that was a good foreign policy decision, whether you're an advocate of free trade or not, our industry where in apparel 70% of the cost of turning textiles into finished goods apparel is labor. So no matter how efficient you are, no matter um, you know how quick you are and responsive you are to market, the differential when your labor costs are you know, a third elsewhere, or in some cases a tenth elsewhere, there's just no opportunity to compete you know, on, on price. And there's been an erosion of the market. We lobbied Washington, D.C., and we had demonstrations. And you'd be surprised how many people we talked to. And I like that because I went to Washington, I knocked on doors. I mean, whoever goes and see a senator, or, or I went to see my congressman. Uh, but we had the, the Southerners, I'd say that, didn't think much of it because they had textile mills. But when it starts hurting their constituents, they practically came on board. But it was a little bit too late. And it was all politics right from Washington, which was another thing. We tried to build up a good political program so that people would know what was going on in the changes in the, the government and everything. But some of them were stalwart, didn't want to bother with that. But we had some that were darn good politicians. 
80% of the cost of textiles is capital. Only 20% is labor. Actually, it's 20% is labor and energy. Um, so there is no reason in the world why the textile industry should have lost market share, um, but they did. In my opinion, the reason they did is instead of investing in new mills and new processes and new designs, which would have protected the apparel industry because we'd be closer to the textile market, what they did is they invested in the protectionism. And so they, did, they weren't forced to make these investments. And right now, when I go to the mills that I work with in China, the state of the art of machinery is 10 or 12 years beyond the state of the art of the machinery of you know, Burlington and North Carolina or something along those lines. They picked up on that technology, and once you lose the technology, then, then what, what it drives, you're going to lose that too. And that's precisely what happened. We went through that transition where we then started to buy equipment overseas. Those parts of the world looked at it and said, I can do that. And so we, we slowly lost that. If labor is a large percent of your cost, uh, and that's more so in the apparel industry than necessarily the textile industry, then uh, the lowest cost labor is probably going to win that market. An industry had to be sold down the river, and I honestly believe that it was the garment industry, and that's when it started going down, when we got that fair trade agreement. We did my, remember, we did my trading. We believe in fair trade, not free trade. Free trade, you could give everything you want away. And I could say that for a lot of companies, few companies around. We always had some, Leslie Fay always had some work here, and then they sent the other one back, uh, sent overseas. So free trade and fair trade is two different things. The ILGWU did a very famous study in the 1980 called A Tale of Two Bras, one, one of which was made in Mexico, one of which was made in Pennsylvania. And the bras at Macy's in New York City sold for the same amount, let's say roughly $5 in 1979. So the retail cost to the consumer was the same. The difference was in the cost of manufacturing those bras. The bra made in Mexico cost about $1.25 to make. The bra made in Pennsylvania cost about $2.75 to make. Because the worker in Pennsylvania had health care benefits, was paid a decent wage, had vacation time, had workers' compensation, sick, sick time, and unemployment compensation, whereas the worker in Mexico had none of those what we call today to be benefits. So where did that profit accrue? The profit accrued, the union argued, not to the consumer. The consumer didn't buy that product for any less. The profit accrued to the shareholder of the company that retailed that bra in the American marketplace. So I think that the jury is probably still out and we won't know for quite some time the extent to which the American consumer may or may not benefit from products that are made less expensively overseas. Well, it used to be internationally these garment workers, ILGW is now United because we are, we are combined now so with the amalgamated and of course now it's Unite Here, H-E-R-E, -E, which is hotel employees, retail. We employ right now about 45 people uh, down from when we were in the big shop. We moved into this facility about five and a half years ago. Um, we started, in, when I left the, the old Manhattan shirt plant, we had two, over 200 employees um, we moved here with a hundred, uh, unfortunately because of climate conditions and that being climate in the industry, um, we downsized to about 60 and then to about 50 and we are where we are today and we make uniforms for the government, we make uniforms for my company and we do s some contract work as well. You know it's gotten to the point where our ability to produce goods overseas now is pretty good and so um, unless there's a, a niche or a protected market and there are some protected markets for example we're in the um, the school apparel business that um, 
and many of the Catholic schools in the diocese feel strongly about domestic labor and we'd love to produce as much of our plaid uniforms as we can um, locally and domestically um, as long as the market demands it. The textile industry is one that should be built on wheels because it's always changing, it's always going to the lowest cost producer. Um, sadly for the American textile industry, it's all offshore today. I think that when you look at why our industry is where it is today, um, it's not as a result of anybody's planning or ill planning. Uh, the one particular customer that I started to work with again uh, had gone offshore, was making goods in India and in Mexico. The deliveries were uh, two to three months late, and when they came, finally arrived, the quality, the coats all had to be repressed, refurbished, redone. Uh, sometimes the, just the, the overall tailoring was not up to standard. And so their business suffered dramatically. And so they decided that they needed to find a captive shop domestically, not too far away, and they're located in Hanover, Pennsylvania. So it's uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, going to be to our benefit. It's sad um, what's happened to the industry here. It, uh, you know, some of it's our own darn fault, but you know, some of it is, you know, a function of the fact that we have a labor-intensive industry in a country that has a wonderfully high standard of living, and um, and you know the it's just not a good fit, and and the industry isn't a good fit for the country. And you know, I if I had known that at the time, I probably would not have chosen to be in it. There have been facilities that have sprung up in New York, in suburban New York City, metropolitan New Jersey, um, and other port areas that refurbish this stuff that comes in in these containers after it's in a container for oh, three weeks coming from the Orient or wherever, or a week from South America, Dominican Republic. They bring it into these refurbishing warehouses where they take them out of the containers, they strip off the plastic bags that they were shipped, they steam them up, they fix buttons. And today we have immigrants coming here who are undocumented who, and who are illegal. If you look at where many of them are working, they are working in industries where Americans won't take jobs. Service industries, manufacturing industries, uh, they are working in the so-called underground apparel industry in New York City for far less than minimum wage in sweatshop conditions. So is there any, any going back? I think to some extent, free trade agreements have forced us to go back, not just in this country, but in many of these overseas nations that are taking these jobs to sweatshop conditions that existed in the United States at the turn of the last century. Uh, right now, it's Asia. Um, not so much in the Middle East, but Eastern Europe. Turkey is a very large textile producer, second largest in Europe. But they're already feeling the pressure of, of pricing. The Chinese are starting to complain about the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese are complaining about the low costs in Africa. So someday we'll all be back in the United States when we're working for 25 cents an hour again. <laughs> so it's, it's always on the move. And the fact that a few of my old menswear customers who went offshore and subsequently became uh, frustrated because deliveries were not what they should be, quality was not what they should be. Um, they're now coming back to looking for domestic facilities to make them, to manufacture their, their garments. And unfortunately, there are not a lot of them around. And so that kind of makes us a commodity and hopefully that will give us some sort of longevity. Price isn't everything. And it's the quality and delivery so that's what we've tried to pride ourselves on, that we deliver within a, a reasonable amount of time and we uh, uh, make a quality product. Now some girls are glad to work for love with a boss who is a petter. But I prefer a union shop with conditions that are better. 
Now, if someday you get that well-known wink, be on your guard. It's later than you think. The boss may be smart, but a gal should remember the union is a girl's best friend. Remember, his heart is as cold as December as he spends each day to find a way to cut your pay. All the while, he wears a smile and he reaps in a big dividend. But ask for more money, then he's not so funny. The union is a girl's best friend. He'll take you to dine. He'll be sweet as molasses. He doesn't care how much he spends. He'll take you to dine and then start making passes. And if you agree, someday you'll be the four lady. Every gal must have morale. If you don't, he'll get you in the end. So don't make a contact without a union contract. The union is a girl's best friend.